101 WROI, WROIFM.com. Streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5. We'll soon have audio and video on RTC Channel 4. Hey, Dakota, how you doing? Doing good. Welcome back to the studio. Thanks. Nice to have you with us. Nice to have John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, with us today. Good morning. Good morning. John. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yes. You always stop by after a board meeting the day before. You got to kind of unwind and let's just, you know, get everybody aware of what we did in the board meeting. Exactly. So, uh, kind of a, a slim meeting yesterday. We're kind of, you know, like in the summer, everybody slows down a little bit. So do we, preparing for, as we get into the fall, we'll be starting our budget process and capital acquisitions, what we think we're going to need for the next year. So we're kind of resting up, I guess, and getting ready for that. So we did have a couple presentations yesterday. Uh, we went to the, the board to approve a new, what's called a C-arm, which is a portable x-ray unit that they use in the surgery department. In the past, we've had uh, one that's you know, been working and we had a little glitch with it, so we had to bring a rental unit in. Well, once the physicians got to use that rental unit, I was given the instructions, we need to upgrade. So uh, we are looking at uh, to do that. The board did approve it yesterday, and I think it's going to be a, a much needed improvement. Uh, the older unit had uh, the detector head was a 9 inch. Well, by moving to the new one, it's going to be a 12 inch. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but the primary example is with Dr. Sheedy and his interior hips with our older unit he'd have to take two views because he couldn't see the complete both hips at the same time. With the 12-inch detector head, he can now take one view and see both hips. So, you know, more efficient for him, but more importantly, it exposes the patient to much less radiation. So, uh, you know, we kind of went through that, and uh, once we kind of give all the particulars to the board, it was one of those they said, wow, th we need to do this because it's better for the patient, gives a much better tool for the physician. This one has a little more power to it. So if you're a larger patient, again, with this newer technology, they can get a much clearer, better picture through the denser tissue that you might have. So it could be a nice addition to the hospital. You know, as we're looking, what do we need to do to make it safer, better for our patients and for our physicians? This is just one more item that we're adding to that to really up our game to, to get to that level. One of the things that we're doing as an organization as we're looking for 2020, 2021, and 2022 is what do we need to do to make ourselves, and what we're calling is, you know, a regional center of excellence. Okay. Uh, that's our goal. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a lofty goal because we have a lot of neighbors around us that do a very good job. We have to do a better job. So we're identifying what are we really good at? What do we want to market? What do we want to put out there to make ourselves better? So we're starting, uh, you know, next week or so, we're going to have kind of a retreat for all the leadership team and, and brainstorm. Say, what do we need to do to get us to that next level? There's some certifications that we're looking to bring on board starting in 2020. And it's not where you just apply and they automatically give it to you. You have to earn those. And it's going to be hard work for all of us. But we're looking to become like a, a chest pain center of excellence, a stroke center of excellence. We're even looking into the possibility, can we become a level four trauma center? That's something new within the state of Indiana. Other states have a level four, which is, you know, your lowest level of a trauma center. But it's still, it says we have the technology to treat some of those traumas that are now being transported, you know, to Fort Wayne or to South Bend because okay. that's the closest trauma center. Uh, a lot of work for the staff. We've kind of put the challenge out to them, and they all said we can do it. So as we move the next two to three years, and that's probably what it's going to take to get a lot of these. Again, you have to earn these certifications. They just don't willy-nilly say, you want it, here it is. So uh, we've set our goal to be that in the next three years, have those certifications in place. And I think that's going to make a major difference to the you know, our patients. Right now, you know, they're having to travel. Our families are traveling because a patient's being transported to Fort Wayne due to a seriousness of an accident. If we can just keep 10% of those here, which if we become a level four trauma center, that is those patients then we can keep. So, you know, it's best for our patients and for their families. So that's what we're trying to do to get to that point. So hard work ahead of us, but uh, have confidence that the staffs will be able to do that. Back to the C-arm for a second, John. Mm -hmm. Is that expensive? It's a very expensive piece of equipment. Okay. Uh, you know, they're 100000 plus. I think the one we're looking at, it's not the most expensive, but it's not the cheapest. And what we'd like to do is when we look at those units, Dollars and cents can't drive our decision. It's part of it, but it can't be that total decision. So what we want to look at is safety to the patient, you know, the amount of radiation that it puts out, image quality that it gives for the physician and our staff. So we found, I think it's 163, 164,000 what this unit's going to cost us. Like I say, there was some 175, 180,000. 
bells and whistles on there that we would never use. So, you know, our philosophy is if we're not going to use it, why pay for it? Let's get what we need. So there's units much cheaper than that, but what we found there, again, was that to meet our needs. And uh, by looking at the, the different units, we decided, let's go with this, a GE model. So uh, I think that's going to meet the needs of our staff, absolutely meet the needs of our surgeons. They absolutely love, uh, they've seen the unit, uh, the detail from the image and the ma- the view. That's the biggest thing is a much larger view of, of when they're looking at the patient instead of uh, taking two, two films, what they call them, or two shots. We can do it all in one. And uh, that's what they want to see. How soon? Probably going to take about five to six weeks. The order will go in uh, probably tomorrow. We get the purchase order cut. Once we, you know, board approves it, then we still have some internal processes where I have to then finally sign off on that project. Say, yes, it's finally approved through everybody in the organization. We want to make sure we have uh, maintenance involved. We have IT involved because it, a piece of equipment affects more than just the department that buys it. It has a lot of people. So we want to make sure everybody's on board. They're all aware and we say, we need, you need to sign off that you're aware of what's coming is. So when it gets here, we're ready. We can put it in place. And so we're hoping four to five weeks to uh, have the unit in place and operational. We have to do some training with the staff. It's a different model than what we currently have. So it'll be some minor training. But uh, everybody's excited about getting it in yeah. there. And it's, I think it's going to be a really nice addition to our diagnostic imaging department. And again, up their level, up their game, just to bring them up to that A-plus level. We're not talking about cars, but any trade-in value on the old one? Not really. <laughs> there, there's not really trade-in value on that. Uh, you know, there is some value to it. Uh, there's several companies around that will say they buy used medical equipment. And what they'll do, they'll buy it, refurbish it. And sometimes it stays here in the United States. Sometimes they sell them overseas. Okay. So, uh, you know, for us, it's no longer meeting our needs. It's to that point, almost the end of useful life. So it's hard to find some of the parts for some of these things. Whereas for some reason, you know, some of the overseas, you know, we'll take it. So we'll try to hopefully market it to one of the resellers and then uh, whatever they do. And they might just use it for parts. Okay. You know, it, it might be sure. a good machine that they can put there and, and as somebody needs right. a part, They can take it off and and fix a unit if they're not ready to purchase a new unit. Okay, excellent. The other thing that we're excited, uh, several years ago when I first started the hospital, we had ENT services. And then that kind of went away. So we haven't had an ENT for probably five, six, seven years. that is? Ear, nose, and throat. Okay. Uh, So if anybody's got kids, that's the (laughs) ear tubes, the tonsils, and the adenoids. You know, that's kind of the the bread and butter of that practice. So we've been shipping or, you know, referring those out to outside sources. So families have been having to drive. We've contracted with a company that's going to provide us an ENT starting in October. They'll be on site for two weeks, then off, and then back on for two weeks. So every two weeks, they'll be here. They'll be doing surgeries, office visits. And uh, just preliminary, we're talking to our physicians. We've probably been referring right now up to 50 patients per week to another location. So, I mean, it's we and that's conservative. Uh, I think some weeks we probably had more. So we are, we're confident we're going to keep that physician busy. We're hoping that as that practice grows, we'll have full-time. Instead of just kind of a half-time, we'll develop that back to a full-time practice. But we're going to start just right now, just two weeks per month, starting in October. Uh, they'll be located up in what we call our Rochester Surgical Services okay. office with uh, Dr. Nile and the surgery suite. So uh, excited to get that back in place. So there was fairly substantial investment in equipment because, again, we haven't used the service for several years. So what equipment we have, we no longer feel comfortable using that. Let's, we got to get new in. So uh, we're going to spend probably about seventy-five to $80,000 on equipment and supplies to get it up running. But again, physicians are excited about it. And I think the best thing is, as a parent, if you have you know those kids, we're not saying, well, we can't do that. You need to drive to South Bend, Indianapolis. You, know, you can get it right here local again. Perfect. And uh, just needs to be done for the community. Excellent. So again, excited about that program. Once we got past those two presentations, we kind of got into the financials for the month. And this would be what we experienced in June. Uh, gross revenues, about $12.7 million. We wrote off $8.4 million. So, again, we're right in that same dollar amount. We're writing off right about 60%. Uh, left us a net revenue of 4.4. Unfortunately, we spent 4.7. Okay. So, we had uh, an, an operational loss. But we have some, you know, what we call non-operating revenue, which is not directly related to patient care, of about 355000 So, when you factor that in, we actually had a small profit for the month of about $67,000. 
our goal is to make sure we have an operational profit. That's what where we want to get to. So we're not relying on you know that non healthcare related non to where we need to be. Care. And the, the unfortunate part, so what we found when we looked at our financials, is uh, we've experienced and it's uh, you know a high dollar amount in employee health benefits, either. Um, serious illness with employees or family members and uh, through the first six months we're actually a million dollars over budget in that so that just tells me we've got some really really sick people that yes. you know, are on our plan and that's unfortunate and it doesn't happen all the time i think this right. is one of those years where it just kind of everything's is hitting us um and that's one of those control costs you can't control you know and the unfortunate part these people had to go elsewhere this is dollars we've spent at other uh, hospitals other surgery centers you know it's just something we can't do so that tells me it's a very serious illness and we feel bad for the staff and their employee and their, and their family members that are experiencing that but we're kind of seeing it on the financial side too so you know the board's aware of that we're trying to see is there a better way to handle that and right now there's not and uh, we're just hoping that as time goes on we get our staff back everybody on the mend and feeling good and hopefully reduce that as we move forward on track for the year as far as your budget goes john uh, if we exclude the okay. employee health benefits right now we're about if we exclude that we're 1.2 percent over budget which is pretty darn good when you consider Close. we're talking about yes. expenses that we're within that one percent of what we thought we should be so we're we're happy with that the staff the directors are really really working hard to keep us within our budget on the expense side. This one little thing, blip here, is kind of throwing us off. And, uh, again, something we can't control. So it's uh, that's the hard part. You you wish you could, but you know you can't. So, Don Alley's president and CEO, Woodlawn Hospital. Any other notes from the board meeting? That was pretty well it. Uh, again, we're looking forward. We're starting the budget process. So it's very early on. We're hoping to have a preliminary budget to the board probably at the October board meeting. I was going to say, give us a thumbnail sketch of how that works because there's there's several th factors it, involved it. In takes it. a long time. What we try to do now is look at history because you can't, you know, unlike a lot of manufacturing, we don't know how many parts we're going to make. So what we try to look at is on a historical trend, what do we anticipate from the, the services that's going to be needed by the community? So we're, we're predicting who's going to be sick and how many days we're going to have hospitalization. So we start there first. We say, okay, here's our revenue. We anticipate we're going to bring in X number of dollars. Then we go back and look at from the expense side, certain areas are fixed. We, we know that's never going to change. If we saw zero patients, we'd still have that expense. So we factor in the fixed first, then start factoring in the variables. And it's a best guess. Okay. You know, I mean, that, that's the best way I can say it is, you know, we have that official, you know, accounting term called a swag. Uh, so, but it's, it's, it's that. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to, when you sit there and go, you know, can't you get better at this? Because of healthcare, we are such a volatile business that, you know, you don't know what your order is going to be. We're working to put ourselves out of business. You know, we want to keep healthy. We, we do the wellness programs to prevent you from becoming ill. Well, if you're not ill, you don't come see us. So it's kind of a catch-22, and it's uh, very difficult to do that. So once we finally get some of the revenue guesstimate out there, again, we base that on historical trends. Then we apply, if we know we're going to have this revenue, here's probably the percentage in each of these categories for the expenses. So we put that in, and we put the labor budget together. And there you're anticipating, again, how many staff members are we going to need to treat this? So we look at back to the revenue. We anticipate X number of patient days. That takes X number of bodies to do that. So we start backing through all that. And then we finally, hopefully at some point, get to a, a point where we say, okay, here's our first draft and what is our bottom line? And we try to budget a positive bottom line. Okay. So then if it's, that's a red number, we start over and start saying, okay, where can we make some differences? And then we start fine-tuning to see where are we going to get with this? Once that's done, then we're required by the federal government to submit and have on file a three-year capital budget. And we have to anticipate what are we going to buy in capital improvements year one, year two, and year three. Well, so, even that's not easy to do. That's not easy to do. So, you know, you're, what you do now, you go back to the department and say, okay, how old is your equipment? So if they got a piece of equipment that's five to six years old, we anticipate it's probably got another year useful life. So we'll put that, it'll go into the 2021 budget or the 2022. So we're trying to predict those out. And then what we do, we like to make whatever our capital expenditure is to match what our depreciation expense is. So like this year, we are going to depreciate or write off about one 
$1.2 million in depreciation. So that's what we anticipate. We'd like to, whatever we write off, we'd like to spend, put that money back into the organization through improvements and new products. So it takes several months to get it done. And uh, again, when you when you get done, at best, it's a guess, you know, because it's just so hard to, to determine, you know, what kind of illness we're seeing. You, we look at trends, we get with CDC. We kind of, you know, talk to them. What do you think the flu season is going to be like? Exactly. Is there a new strain of flu coming out? Because if that's happening, we're going to see an increased patient volume because right. people aren't used to that yet. So it's uh, it's exciting, but it's also scary at the same time. It's kind of fun to do, and you, you just you feel good. Like right now, when we look back and we're within, you know, one to two percent of our best guess on expenses that's pretty darn good when you consider the amount of money that we spend you know we're, we're spending right now eight point uh, where are we at here uh five million a month right to be able to get within one right. to two percent of that a year ago um uh, pretty proud of what the staff does on that again john alley president ceo of woodlawn hospital and uh as always, uh, keep up the good work that uh, everybody at Woodlawn Hospital is doing. And you always give the folks a lot of credit out there, don't you? It, they make me look real good. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of the, the best things you can say is that if you surround yourself with extraordinary people, you will be good yourself. And I've got it, the staff is just, they truly care about the patients. That's the key. You know, it's, uh, we stress that over and over again. Without the patients, we're nothing. Right. So we really try to meet their needs best we can. Do we make everybody happy all the time? No. You know, we, we've come to the conclusion, some people you can't make happy, <laughs> but we're still going to see them. We're going to do our best. And uh, I think they do an outstanding job in, in meeting those needs and get to know the patient. And it's, you know, we do have, you know, a lot of sick people and it's, you know, it, it makes you feel good when you see patient, the fa- or the uh, staff members feeling sorry. I mean, they, they truly, if a patient's not doing well, I've seen staff members crying they because, sure. you know, Mrs. Smith is not doing as well sure. as they think she should. Sure. Uh, that tells me they truly care about what they do. Exactly. The uh, I'm just curious, last question, the Level 4 Trauma Center, how long does that process take? We're probably looking on that a minimum of 18 months uh, because, again, you have to apply to the state. We have to demonstrate what our capabilities are. We have to be able to then track some of the things that we do. So it's a long process, and it should be. They should not just come in and say, here you are, because, you know, we're, you're talking about seriously sick or injured people at that point. I want the state to make sure I know what I'm doing before they tell me you can see these people. So I'm glad there's this long process to get that done. Uh, we kind of know what the steps are. So it's just you just do step one, step two, and you march through the whole process to get to that point. You know, and we might get two-thirds way through it and say, you know, we're not going to do this to the level that we feel like we should. If we get to that point, we'll stop the process because, again, I do not want to do something that we're not good at. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it and do it the best of our ability, and I want to make sure we're there before we go to that final step. John Alley, again, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, and uh, thanks for all you do to keep people healthy. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you.